Testing. Testing. Slight technical difficulties. If you guys can can see me, please comment on this video so I know we are live. If you can see me, if you can hear me. Oh, there we go. All right, are you guys with me? Get that out there. So I apologize for the delay. There was a little technical difficulty. For some reason, uh, could not stream from the desktop site from Facebook, but mobile seems to be working fine. So uh, we'll get going in just a bit. Hold on, hold tight just a bit. We'll get a few viewers coming in and uh, we'll get going. Again, if you have any comments, please, or questions throughout this, please let me know in the comments section below. I'll get to all of them. We'll, uh, we'll have some fun with it. Tonight's topic is the NCAA drug and alcohol policy. You know, a little bit of a heavier topic than what we're used to, but it's an important policy. It's a, poor, it's a big part of college sports, something every athlete needs to deal with, and uh We'll talk about what you can and what you cannot take, the punishment for failing a drug test, how to educate yourself on the banned substance list, and a whole lot more. Um, we'll get. All right. Working out a little kink here, but we're back. Um, let me just get this up and running. All right, beautiful, beautiful. All right. All right, so let's get going. You know, I had a few minor delay. I apologize about that, but we'll get going. The show must go on, as they say in the industry. Nothing could stop us now. Um, so again, my name is Nick Petrella. I'm sure you probably know that by now. Um, tonight we're talking about the NCAA drug and alcohol policy. We, um, as I said before, it's you know a heavier topic maybe than what we're used to talking about, but it's something that every athlete deals with it's something that um it's a part of college sports for better or for worse you know sometimes unfortunately it's almost every time you hear about it it's when it's too late when it's um it's in the news for a negative reason so we're going to hopefully get in front of this get out in front and teach you guys everything you need to know about the banned substance list what you can and what you cannot take the punishment for um taking something on the banned substance list for failing a drug test and, um, you know, everything you need to know. So again, if you have any questions, comments that you want answered throughout this, if you have any stories you think could be helpful to anyone watching this, please let us know in the comments. I'll read them. I'll answer any questions. Um, but before we do anything, let's get, um, Let's get you guys onto our website, LockerRoomTalk.com, where you could rate your coach, help high school athletes with the recruiting process, help make it honest and easy. We will, um, our goal by December 1st is 10,000 ratings. We're at, we're cr creeping up to 9,000. We need your help to get to 10. So anything you do, rate your coach today at LockerRoomTalk.com. All right, so let's get going. We... What is a banned substance? What is uh, the list, per se, that the NCAA says you cannot take? The NCAA breaks it down into eight categories. The first one being stimulants. Um, the second one being anabolic agents. Third is alcohol and beta blockers, but that is only for rifle. That's the only sport where that is um, considered a banned substance. Um diuretics, which are basically water pills or other masking agents, um, illicit drugs, peptide hormones and analogs, anti-estrogens and beta-2 agonists. So, I mean, even me from reading that, I don't really know what that all means. Um, there's a lot of words that I've never heard before, before, you know, looking into this list. So it's important to do your research. NCAA has a great um, list where they kind of lay out a few drugs or um, substances that fall under these categories. Um, for example, stimulants, you know, Adderall, 
caffeine, ephedrine, you know, and a few other things along those lines. Anabolic agents are more like the classic, you know, steroids that you hear about. And again, these are all banned. They all kind of carry the same weight in terms of what your punishment is. And the NCAA, NCAA even do, says that there is no complete list of banned substances. Anything that um, there's just so many things that are banned that they can't they simply cannot list them all out. So it's very important that you get advice from your athletic trainers, you know, they would be the people who know best at your school. If you're unsure if you can or cannot take something, don't take it, bring it into your athletic trainer, let him or her give it a look, do some research, maybe run some tests on it and see if it will um, show up on a drug test or not. You know, it's really important. You see all the time, even at the professional level, somebody fails a drug test, somebody, um, you know, just the other day, a UFC fighter, John Jones, failed a drug test for steroids. And a lot of times they say, oh, I didn't know it was on the banned substance list or, oh, I didn't know I take it, took it. So why it's always important to consult your athletic trainers. Let them know, hey, I saw this thing like at the store the other day. Can I take it? Um, or, um, you know, there's a lot of times NCAA warns that not every ingredient in a dietary supplement will even be on the label. So you could be taking something that you honestly had no idea that you were taking. But again, the NCAA doesn't really make exceptions for ignorance. There's things, there are steps that you can take to protect yourself. The main one, just ask questions. If you aren't sure, just ask. Um, your athletic trainer knows best. They, it's part of their job. They're taught, they, um, you know, they obviously learn a lot about it. They teach their athletes about it. They've been doing it for years. And also a lot of times a school will, um, like have a, you know, training course. You know, I, I know in my athletic experience at Skidmore, um, every year before the season started, yeah, we had a big meeting, signed a lot of papers, went over a lot of stuff. And part of the thing that we went over was the NCAA drug and alcohol policy. To be perfectly honest, I didn't pay much attention to it. I'm sure a lot of college athletes will say the same thing. And just saying that doesn't sound great, but it's just so much paperwork, so much sitting there and listening that honestly, you can forget something or something could slip by that you aren't really sure, um, or you aren't really sure if you heard or not. And instead of asking questions, you just kind of, um, it's almost something that's too little, too late. You can't ask questions after the fact. You can't get the eligibility back. Once you fail a drug test, it's gone. Um, and so we have a question here from Kirsten. Where should student athletes go to ask questions about the drug and alcohol policies? Great point. Great question. Um, like I said, there are, The NCAA itself doesn't have a full list of banned substances because there are just so many. So go to your athletic trainers, go to your, you know, your teammates, if they have heard of something, if they have taken something before that um, they know is all right, you know, you'll be good to go. If the athletic trainer isn't sure at that point, I would say it's not worth the risk. Just try to find something else. Don't take it. Don't, um... Don't jeopardize your playing career, the the success of your season for your teammates, for your coaches. You know, it's an embarrassing thing to fail a drug test, obviously. So it's not th- something that anyone wants to go through. Um, and so now we'll move on to kind of what happens if you do fail a drug test, whether, you know, if you didn't know you took something illegal or you did know a failed drug test is a failed drug test. The punishment is the same. They're not going to be able to talk your way out of it. Um, the only way actually, if you do fail a drug test, the only way you would be allowed to get out of it is if you have a medical exemption, if you have, you know, a prescription drug that you need to take, that is something that you can only be exempt for if you clear it with your athletic department ahead of time, you can't fail a drug test for something and say, Oh, well, I'm actually prescribed this. That's too late. You need to have it cleared beforehand, where if you do show up on a drug test positive for this certain stimulant or whatever it may be that the NCAA, whoever's testing you knows, all right, this isn't actually a negative test. He or she is allowed to be taking this. Um, We got another question here. How often do student athletes get drug tested? Is there a difference in frequency in different divisions? Great point. Great question, Kirsten. Um, So the NCAA does drug testing at all three levels, but they are not 
um, even amongst the three. For Division one's, 1 and 2, the NCAA says they do year-round drug testing. So at any point during the season, you could have somebody come in and say, we need these four athletes on this team to submit a drug test, you know, with no prior warning, nothing. They could just show up one day at, after practice, before a game. Um, and then the, in, at the Division three level, they only test at the NCAA championship. So... If you're at, if you play D three and you're at the, you know, regional World Series, whatever it may be, the NCAA tournament, the championship, um, you are at risk to be drug tested after the game. There would be an official at the NCAA in your locker room or waiting after the game with a list already premeditated of who they're going to pick these four or five athletes. So. That's at the NCAA level. And then on top of that, schools can also drug test you. And this is separate from the NCAA. Um, schools can have their own policies. There's no set standard that each school needs to drug test X amount of times. You know, some schools drug test a lot. Some don't drug test at all. Um, some do here and there. Or some might even say, hey, we're going to drug test, you know, a month from now. Make sure everyone's, in, you know, things like that. So the school drug testing, it's not as, not, it is structured. I shouldn't say it's not structured, but each school has a different policy. So it's tough to speak on because like I said, one school can be completely different from the other. Um, in terms of failing a drug test, let's say you fail an NCAA drug test. What is your punishment? Um, if you fail for a performance enhancing drug, then you automatically lose one year of your eligibility. You can't, you're suspended for a year. You can't get that year back of eligibility. It's not like you could red shirt and get it back. If you miss that from the day you fail a drug test, you are ineligible until 365 days later. No matter, you know, if you're a senior, your career is done. If you're a junior, hopefully you could come back for a little bit of your senior year, but it's 365 days. You lose the eligibility, no FNs or buts. If you fail for a what they consider a street drug, it is you lose 50% of your eligibility for each season that you compete in. If, that, if I didn't word that correctly, the NCA lists it out as um, the penalty for a positive test for a substance in the street drug class is withholding from competition for. 50% of the season in all sports in which a student athlete participates. So if you are a two sport athlete and you fail a test, let's say you play football and baseball, you know, classic or lacrosse in the spring, field hockey in the fall. If you fail a drug test for a street drug, you lose 50% of your L you cannot compete in 50% of those games for each season. So it's not just one season. If you play multiple sports, you get basically double the double the punishment. Um, and then if you fail at that's at the NCAA level, if you fail at the college level, if you fail not one of the NCAA tests, if you fail the test that the school gives you, you get um, the schools want to punish you, not the NCAA. And the school should have like structure in place where, okay, a failed drug test is X amount of games or X percentage of your eligibility. And if the school is caught to not um, enforce those punishments, then they will get the school itself will get NCAA sanctions. Actually, with the big scandal going on with Baylor football, a big part of what is coming out is that they not only didn't drug test their football players, but the ones that they did drug test and failed, they didn't punish. They didn't follow what was the standard protocol at that school. So that's only going to build up on the sanctions. So the NCAA and the school do drug testing a little differently in terms of frequency and standard of punishment. The standards are school to school at the school level. And then obviously the NCAA is kind of across the board. Division one and Division two are the same in terms of year round Um Testing not just at the championship level, Division Three, you will only get tested by the NCAA at the when you make it to the NCAA championship. That's not that's not including the possibility of a school drug testing you. So if you play Division Three, you're not scot free until the championship. There is a chance that your school will drug test you at any point throughout the season. Um, we got a few more questions coming in. Let's take a look here. 
Um, Gabby, some athletes will try to use detox methods before the drug test in order to pass. Can those, I'm sorry, <coughs> can those detox products be detected in a test? Great question, Gabby. Yes, the NCAA um, will test for dilute samples. You know, if you want to detox right before, a, you know, you know you're getting drug tested, you detox or... Not only will the detox agents that you use, that's a chance that they show up on a um, drug test and you will then test positive. If you drink too much water before a drug test and your sample is diluted and meaning that the lab can't really read what is in your urine because it is too like too high of a percentage of water, then that is considered a positive test. So there's no way to get around it if you are worried about whether or not you're going to be able to pass. You know, there's no there's no way around it, really. Like I said, um, based on Gabby's question, the detox agents, they could show up on a drug test. And then again, a diluted sample is considered, the NCAA holds that as a positive drug test. Um, Kyle asks, can a student athlete lose a scholarship if they are caught using an illegal drug? Um, that's a great question, Kyle. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I would assume that most schools will include that in the, um, in like the details of their scholarship, meaning they won't be able to, if they fail a drug test, I'm sure that's written in their scholarship that they will lose it. Um, if, since scholarships aren't necessarily always NCAA based, that again would be school to school. But yes, I would say at least a majority of the time, a athlete will lose a scholarship for failing a drug test, um, for an illegal drug rather. Um, let's see if we got any more coming in. Yes, Kirsten, don't do drugs. That is a that's great advice. You know, very good advice. Um, all right. So then moving on, let's get into. I had a couple, a list of a couple athletes, you know, I thought this might be interesting. Some big time athletes that have failed drug tests. Um, if any of you guys are football fans, Tyron Matthew, who played football at LSU, he's now a member of the Arizona Cardinals. Actually, he's one of, you know, the best defensive players in the NFL, has an all pro career, but his career at LSU was filled with turmoil because, his, I want to say, a sophomore season, he, you know, was one of the best players in the country, a Heisman finalist, and it kind of all got derailed. The next year, he was dismissed from the team for violating team rules. Um, so his coach, Les Miles, never disclosed exactly what that meant, but basically, um, it was because he failed too many drug tests. And this was one of the best football players in the country, playing at one of the best schools in the country, was projected to be, you know, a first round pick, top fifteen round top fifteen pick, you know, probably even higher. Um, and he ended up going into the third round of the NFL draft. Granted, you know, he still got drafted. He's still making millions of dollars in the NFL, but there was a chance that his career got ruined because these drug tests got out and um you know, it would have been a bad situation. He did make the most, he did bounce back, but, you know, failing those drug tests and getting caught up in that did make him fall all the way to the third round, which again, he's still in the NFL and he's such a good player that he was able to overcome it. But that is potentially millions and millions of dollars lost um, for him. And then another, uh, more recently, Will Greer, who was a quarterback at the University of Football, uh, I'm sorry. Football, the quarterback at the University of Florida, bleh, he got suspended for failing a drug test for PEDs, which, as I said earlier, is a one-year suspension, full year, 365 days. Um, and then, you know, it was kind of obviously a tough situation for him, so he ended up transferring to West Virginia, which then again, he lost, he had to sit out a year. He didn't lose the eligibility for having to sit out. He lost the eligibility for failing the drug test transferred to West Virginia. So he had to then sit out a year because of the NCAA transferring rules. And so this upcoming season, excuse me, he can now play again, but that's a year and a half from when he failed his drug test. So again, just kind of, it, it's, it's crazy how long you can, the NCAA makes you sit out. Um, they take it very seriously. The NCAA spends more than $6 million a year on 
drug testing and educating their athletes and their and their institutions on the banned substance list. So it's something they take very seriously for obvious reasons, you know. For PEDs, they need to keep a level playing field that, you know, that goes without saying. And the street drugs category, obviously, that's nothing that to, you know, take lightly and something that they need to make sure all of their athletes who are representing them um, steer clear of. Uh, I, I said it was six million, not quite six billion, but six million is still a lot of money to spend each year. You know, drug testing is expensive <clears throat> and the NCAA does not take it lightly. Um, so I think we might be rounding it up soon. If you have any last minute questions or comments, please let me know. Um, I'll just, you know, to wrap up, why don't I just, you know, run through all the main talking points? Oh, we got, oh, we got another question here from Kyle. How's it going, Kyle? If the NCAA is so strict when it comes to using banned substances, what do you think tempts athletes to use them at the professional level? That's a good point. That's a good question. You know, that's obviously you, we could do uh, hours of debates about, you know, testing at the professional level and performance enhancing drugs at the professional level. Just to touch again upon it briefly, you know, one, maybe they think it gives them the best advantage. You know, it's obviously the best, no matter what sport it is, it's the best athletes at that sport in the entire world, not just the country. You know, people you know, from all over the world are trying to get into the MLB, into the NBA, the NHL, even the NFL now is becoming more and more of a global game. And so they maybe say to themselves, oh, I can take this banned substance and possibly make it to the peak of this this sport that I've been playing my whole life. Maybe that's worth it to them. Or maybe they know if they have two or three great years while using a performance enhancing drug that failing a drug test will be worth it if they can sign that, you know, that 50, $100 million contract beforehand. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Again, that could be a debate that goes on that people have, they do have now for hours at a time. And it's something that I could talk about for, for hours as well. But, you know, at a, for the sake of time, you know, I'll just say some people might think it out the risk. I mean, I'm sorry, the reward of, making it to the professional level or becoming an all-star or an elite player at the professional level, that reward outweighs the risk of a banned um, drug uh, of a failed drug test. And that also ties back into, you know, maybe some of these professional leagues don't do enough to deter people from taking these PEDs and that their punishments aren't harsh enough. But again, that's going off to a completely different um, topic. So I'll round it back in here to the NCAA. Like I said, um, at the beginning of this Facebook Live, there are eight categories of banned substances, according to the NCAA. And instead of just reading through them again, because you probably won't know what the words mean. I don't really know what the words mean, but um, go to NCAA.com. Take a look. They don't. They even admit that they don't have a full list of banned substances. They because there are so many substances out there and so many products out there that they can't name them all. Um, so make sure you, if you have any questions about if you can take something, go to your athletic trainers, go to your coaches, they'll point you in the right direction. And just as a kind of a rule of a, a rule of thumb, if it's in question, don't take it. It's not worth it. The NCAA um, punishments are way too harsh. You could ruin your entire athletic career, ruin your standing with the coach, ruin the standing with your standing with the team, and kind of just ruin your entire um, college athletic experience. Um, briefly, again, the punishments: if you fail a drug test for PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, it's an automatic 365 day loss of eligibility. Um, if it's a street drug. You lose, you cannot compete in 50% of the, um, 50 of the seasons in all sports in which you play. So again, if you play two sports, that's two seasons that you have to miss 50% of. If you miss one, if you only play one, it's 50% of that. But in a way, you almost get punished double if you are a two-sport athlete. So again, not worth it. Um, and then two things briefly that I didn't. Tap, uh, touch on this kind of goes back to Gabby's question. Um, she asked about um, 
diluting a drug test, but if you tamper with a drug test, that's even worse than failing it in the NCAA eyes. You get suspended two calendar years for if you are get caught tampering with a drug test, not just one, two calendar years, you can't compete. So that's a long time. And at that point, if, if you are a freshman, you got two years left. If you're a junior, you're done. Senior, done. Sophomore, you got one left. So tampering with a drug test is a very serious offense in the NCAA eyes. Comes with a two-year suspension. And then if you don't show up to a drug test, if you're called in and you just don't show up or you refuse to do it, the NCAA treats that as a failed drug test. So the same punishment as if you did show up and failed. So... Again, a no-show is a no-go, as I like to say. Again, um, thank you for anyone who, everyone who joined, and thanks for throwing in some comments. Had a lot of fun tonight. Again, visit LockerRoomTalk.com. Rate your coach. Help us get to 10,000 coach ratings. We're the leading um, database of college coach ratings in the country. We're continuing to grow every day. We couldn't do it without you guys. So please head to our website rate your coach, give feedback on them, help these high school athletes with the, one of the hardest decisions of your life. If you know, if you're a college athlete or if you were if you in the past or current, you know how stressful the recruiting process could be. So, you know, pay it forward a little bit, help out these these young athletes and then um in return they'll do the same moving forward. So again, thanks for joining me. Visit lockroomtalk.com, visit follow us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest now. Follow us on Pinterest. We need to get our Pinterest up. Let's go. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Hope you learned some stuff, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks.